Okay, so welcome to the continuation of the protostome lectures. This particular lecture will be over the phylum mollusca, all of the mollusks. So remember, mollusca sits within the group protostomes, then they go within the group spirillia, and then they are further classified as part of the lophotrochozoans, and then we get to phylum mollusca. So again, I can't stress enough, go back to that roadmap. There's that one lecture over protostome overview, and just make sure you understand the path it takes to get down to phylum mollusca. What are the features at the protostome grouping? What are the features at spirillia grouping? And then what are the features of the lophocotrozoans? Now, when we talk about mollusca, this is the second most diverse phylum of animals out there. And we'll get into the most diverse in a couple lectures from now. But these guys have a huge, huge amount of diversity. They are found in the marine environment. They are found in the terrestrial environment and the freshwater environment. Pretty much big spectrum of habitats and ecosystems occupied by members of mollusca. So what I want to do is first talk about the general features of the mollusks, what makes a mollusk a mollusk, and then we're going to get into the four different classes of mollusks. So we're going to phylum mollusca, here's the features, and then we'll drop down into classes and the features of each of the classes and some general examples of organisms that fit into each of those classes of the mollusca. So, all right, so general features here. Let's talk about this first big feature. When we look at the mollusk, what we're going to see is a soft body. They're squishy, they're flabby, they're... I don't know what else to say. You pick up a snail. Don't think about the shell, but think about the body of it. Think about an octopus, a squid. These are general members of phylum mollusca. So they have this soft body. Uh, some of them will have a... Oh, uh-oh, let me get this moved up. Some of the mollusks will have a dorsal shell. Make this a little smaller. A dorsal shell of calcium carbonate. So think about your typical snail. Yeah, it's got the shell. Think about a clam, an oyster, they have a shell. Not all mollusks have shells though. Slugs don't, sea hares, squids, octopus, etc. They don't have that external hard shell. But the soft body is a feature across all of them. They're gonna have a muscular foot that they use for movement to crawl around. So we can see that in our little snail down here. There's the muscular foot. The labeled diagram over here is a little bit better. You can see there's that muscular foot there. This guy has the hard shell as well. Um, when we look at some of or the mollusks, they have what's known as a visceral mass. So let me go to the next slide here. So the visceral mass, which is kind of you kind of look at the visceral mask as the uh, scoot this um, kind of the internal organs all the soft squishy juicy parts here the heart the intestines the gonads these other structures that's what makes up the visceral mass basically the organs of the mollusk so let me put a text box in here for us so the organs are going to make up that visceral mass. Okay, now some of them the visceral mass is positioned above the foot. We can see that with our typical mollusk here. There's the foot, visceral mass sits above it. So general body plan. Um, a lot of times they will have a mantle this is going to be a layer of tissue above the visceral mass. Right. 
So this structure right here, let me get my pen. Find our mantle. So it's, there's the mantle. They drew it in blue here, this blue line here that sits above the visceral mass. Basically, it's a layer between the mantle, the visceral mass, and then the shell. Now, in mollusks that have the shell, that visceral mass is what will it secretes calcium carbonate to form the shell. That is, oh, shell. If I can spell shell correctly, that is a structure that will produce the shell in things like clams and snails, those types of mollusks. Uh, that crazy bladed structure to the right here is known as the radula. So the radula is technically, it's a tongue-like structure. I got spelled tongue right. A tongue-like structure that they use to feed. And quite often, most mollusks will use that radula for scraping algae and feeding on algae. So it's almost like a miniature little chainsaw blade. It's kind of a crazy looking structure there that the snails, think about a snail, it'll crawl along and just scrape and rip and tear up algae. Now other mollusks will have a modified radula that they use to drill holes through the shells of other mollusks. So it gets weird and crazy within this phylum. You have some mollusks that eat other mollusks. They use a radula to drill holes into the shells to get inside of it. Um, so all sorts of functions for this radula. But basically, think about it as a feeding structure. It's hard, it's rigid, it's got durability to it, and it can be very, very sharp. Um, I'll show you some examples of how my radulas are modified, but they use it for feeding. Uh, all right, I'm going to go to the next slide for the next couple of features as well. So again, these are kind of the big general features we find across the mollusk phylum. Uh, let's get another text box here. And okay, um, nephridium. So the nephridium is a structure that has kidney functions. So they labeled it here as a kidney. We will also see it labeled as a nephridium. The key thing it's doing is it's helping the animal maintain osmotic balance. So if you're in a saltwater environment, you need to regulate water water moving in, water moving out, salt levels. That's what this nephridium does, or again, in some mollusks, they consider them kidneys. Other examples, they will have it labeled as nephridium. So here in this example, there's a nephridium there. So whether it's, you want to call it the nephridium or in these other guys, you want to call it the kidneys, it's all doing the same basic function, maintaining osmotic balance. That's what our kidneys do for us is help us maintain osmotic balance. Uh, we'll have, we'll see a hemocele within the mollusks. Oh. So the hemocele is an open circulatory system in which the fluid, the body fluid and the blood will mix at a certain point. Um, it allows for exchange of gases. It's not the most efficient way of exchanging gases, but it works for these guys. Um, the heart will pump the blood, drops the blood into certain areas of the body over the tissues. Again, it mixes with tissue fluid and then circulates the blood into blood vessels, comes back through the gills to pick up oxygen. So open circulatory systems sometimes, and I'll stress, I can't air quote it in a lecture like this, but stress open circulatory systems generally do not give you as much uh, physical activity or mobility as a closed circulatory system in general. But we see ex exceptions to the rules. That's all 
life works, there's always exceptions, um, but we do see that as a feature across most of the mollusks. Okay, and then the last big feature to mention here is when we look at the mollusks, when they we talk about reproduction, we get another box, our last box here. Dunk. When we talk about reproduction, um, most of them are doing sexual reproduction. Some of the mollusks are, mollusks are hermaphroditic. So you may have one mollusk that's a male, one's a female, eggs and sperm. Obviously that combines to form the zygote. The zygote develops into the trophy for larva. So let me do a little drawing here. So the zygote forms, zygote develops into the trophy for larva. That is a key feature to put them into the lophotrochozoans is this larval shape. That trophocophore larva becomes free swimming, moves around, then a lot of times develops into what's known as the veliger larval stage. So you look at that and go, ooh, that almost looks like a, okay, once they've moved into veliger, folks who specialize in mollusks can actually tell you what they're going to become. Is that going to become a squid? Is that going to become an octopus? Is that going to become a snail? Which member of the mollusk group will this developed into as it goes through developmental pathways. The villager larva then develops into whatever the adult version or form will be of that particular larva or that particular mollusk. Okay, so in general, these are the common features across the mollusks. There are always exceptions. They don't all have every single feature. There's twists and tweaks and adaptations to different features. But those are kind of the big pictures to say this puts you in phylum mollusca. Now how you tweak it is what gives you characteristics that move you into the different classes. And each of the classes will have their own kind of unique features and characteristics. All right, so here's the roadmap to the classes. I'm going to introduce these and then in the next couple lectures go into each class in a little more detail. So polyplacophora are known as the chitons. Neat little class, um, some specialized features on these guys. Anybody interested in the mollusks go on the marine biology trip and you will see members of all of these classes in the marine environment. Not all of them are terrestrial groups. Not all of them live in freshwater, but every class here will have a member who lives in the ocean. So it's a great place to go if you're interested in mollusks. Uh, the gastropoda include the snails and the slugs. So again, some, some really fun stories about slugs. Uh, snails, they're actually fantastic to eat. There's some marine snails that are just delicious when you cook them the right way. Uh, we will have the bivalvia. These include the clams, the oysters, and basically, oops, let me capitalize it. All of the mollusks that have two shells. That's what, why we call them a bivalve. So, and again, I'll show you those examples as we move on. And then the cephalopoda. This is where you get your squids, your octopus, and your chambered nautilus and cuttlefish. Oh, should be cuttlefish. Chambered Nautilus. So, all right, so our mollusks, the second, I spelled mollusks, the second most diverse phylum of animals out there. Uh, so, we get into part two, and I'll start walking us through each of the individual classes. So, we definitely want to be familiar with this as a phylum. But I do want you guys to know key features of the different classes here. So we'll get into those in the next lecture.